when everyone gets quiet, that's a good signal. It's time to get started. Uh, we appreciate each of you being here tonight. We appreciate everyone visiting with us. We've got an excellent crowd with us. We've got folks visiting with us from West Sparta, and we've got people from various congregations, and we thank you for being here. And I know that you're here to hear the gospel preached. You're here to be encouraged and uplifted, and that will take place. Brother Chad has been doing a wonderful job of preaching God's word. Uh, for those of you who might not know him, Brother Chad Ramsey is the preacher for the uh, Gloucester Street Congregation in Tupelo, Mississippi. Uh, he also preached at West Sparta. He's preached in gospel meetings all around the country, even out of the country. Uh, he has done a lot of good work. You may not know, he writes the adult literature for the Gospel Advocate Foundations. He also has just finished his doctorate in preaching, advanced preaching. That's You're going to hear that uh, demonstrated tonight. A great job. He taught our Monday morning Bible class this morning and just did a remarkable job of opening God's Word from the book of Genesis, talking about the life of Abraham. And I really wish we had recorded that. I think many of you would have enjoyed the privilege of hearing that class and uh, the wonderful job that he did. And I encourage you tonight to keep your Bibles open, to keep your minds focused on God's Word. And at the end of the service, if you need to uh, study further, we'll be glad to study further with you. If you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we want to encourage you to do that. Uh, it's important that we realize the reason why we're here is to learn God's Word and then to apply what He has taught us. And I know that you will be encouraged by that. Well, Paul Hurst is going to be leading our singing tonight. We're going to begin with number 627, uh, The Glory Land Way. And after a couple of songs, Brother Jeff Turner, who's one of the elders at the West Sparta congregation, will lead us in our opening prayer. And then another song, and then after that, Brother Chad will come and preach God's Word to us. And uh, I encourage you tonight, if you will, to go ahead and focus your minds on our praise and our devotion to God. Brother Paul, would you come lead our singing? Everyone would please stand. Sing 627, all three verses. <coughs> I'm in the way, the bright and shining way.
<clears throat> we'll sing 874, 874, all three verses. <clears throat> Jesus is Lord, I Let us pray. Our Father, we, we approach your throne to thank you so much. Thank you for all that you provide for us, Father. We acknowledge all that we have comes from you. We pray, Father, that you would help us to be good stewards of all of those things that you have placed in our charge. Help us, Father, to do those things that you would have us to do and help us to be very open to receive your word so that we will know what to do, what to say, where to go, who to talk to. Father, we, we pray to thank you for Jesus. May we never forget him, Father. May we never forget his life. May we never forget his death. May we never forget what he has done for us. We appreciate so much, Father, life itself. And we thank you richly for your word. We pray, Father, that our hearts will be open, that we will be good students, that we will study, that you will help us in our application of your word, that you will strengthen us to stand firm. Father, we pray that we will be good examples. Help us to lead our children, to lead our grandchildren, help us to lead our spouses, help us to be leaders in front of our friends, our acquaintances, those we work with, those we come in contact with, Father, help us to have the strength that we need to stand firm for the gospel. We pray, Father, that you would forgive us when we fall short. We acknowledge that we fall short. We sin. We, we do not do the things that we should do far too often. We pray, Father, that we will be able to turn, be able to repent of those things that we have done, and not to dwell on that and to move on and to move forward and to keep our eyes firmly fixed upon heaven. 
We pray, Father, that, that we will seek first the kingdom of God. While we're on this earth, that we will do those things, make those kinds of decisions that will lead us toward heaven. We thank you so much, Father, for your willingness to love us and your willingness to forgive us and your willingness to guide us through your word. We pray this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Yeah. Song of encouragement this, this evening will be 454. <clears throat> After Chad's lesson, we'll be singing that song. But before, we'll sing, Give Me the Bible, first, second, and last verse. <clears throat> Give me the Bible, start of gladness. So very thankful for your presence tonight, especially those of you who are visiting with us. We appreciate your support of this gospel meeting effort and the encouragement that you provide to the good congregation that meets here. As Tony said, if there are questions that you have, we would love to sit down and open up our Bibles together and seek to find God's answer to those questions. Our desire more than anything else is to do the will of God. I know that there are several gospel preachers in the audience tonight. We thank you for being here. And I was thinking uh, as I was sitting there that every gospel preacher will remember his first full-time work, won't you? Sometimes for good and sometimes for ill. And I understand that. 
but I can't help but be thankful for the good church at West Sparta and for, at that time, Kenneth Broyles and Don Pearson and Walt Holman and Bo Young, who were my elders. And uh, Bo, it's hard to believe, but that was 30 years ago when I first came to West Sparta. And 30 years goes by in a blink. Um, I am what I am in part because of those good folks. Now, don't go blaming them, but they helped me tremendously in many, many ways, and I will always be indebted to them, and I'm so very thankful for their support of this effort, and you can tell who still owes me favors because they came tonight, and so I appreciate that too, but we are thankful for your presence. It is not always easy to live like a Christian. The devil is doing everything within his power to ensnare us in his vices. And those who are not attempting to live the Christian life, those who are not seeking to follow Jesus, are actually puzzled by our desire to be dedicated. And sometimes they are militant in their efforts to denounce anything that is associated with Christianity. Sadly, there are times in which we are our own worst enemies. We allow worldly desires, ambitions, even greed, to stand in our way of being what we should. And those things that the world prizes and the things that the world values become our own objects of devotion and our idols of adoration. We face temptation. We face ridicule. We face disappointment. And we become discouraged. There are various reasons for that kind of discouragement. It could be that you're struggling with a physical illness that you did not foresee, you certainly did not ask for, and you do not know how to overcome. It could be that a relationship that you are in, your marriage or with your children or with your in-laws or with your neighbors or even with the people that you work with has gone south. And because of that, your life is in constant turmoil. There could be financial difficulties, problems with addiction, and problems that are not your fault, but you still have to suffer the consequences. And we deal with these struggles and we face these difficulties and sometimes we begin to wonder whether or not what we're doing here tonight actually matters. We have a tendency to question God and to ask him, God, if you're listening to my prayers, why is my life the way that it is? Why have all of these things happened to me when there are so many other people around us who don't seem to be struggling, who don't seem to be facing these same trials, these same turmoil in their life? Why me? And why now? And sometimes we get to the point where we're ready to throw our hands up in the air and say, enough. I just can't do it any longer. I don't have the strength to go on. If you have ever felt that way, the book of Hebrews is for you. It was written to individuals who were struggling in their faith. Individuals who were being pulled by the traditions of their past, the Judaism that they had left behind to the point that they were almost ready to relinquish their faith in Christ, but they weren't just facing pressure from the Jews that they had left. They were facing pressure from the pagans of the world that surrounded them. And so they were faced with a choice. Will I continue to affirm my faith and be faithful to the Savior, or will I just let it all go? You have statements in the book of Hebrews like what you find in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1 where the text says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift 
away. That phrase was written to individuals who were on the edge. Would they remain faithful or would they drift away? Would they keep their faith or would they relinquish it? In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12, the text goes on to say, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. It is entirely possible for an individual to lose his or her faith to develop an evil heart of unbelief and leave, let go of what you have long clung to. And the author of Hebrews wanted the Christians to be warned. We mentioned in a previous lesson a statement that you find in Hebrews the 10th chapter and the 23rd verse. In that text, the author says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. If it is possible to drift away, which is what these brethren were being warned about, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, if it is possible to have an evil heart of unbelief and depart from the living God, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 12, if it is possible to relinquish our confession of faith, to waver in our devotion to God, then you and I need to be encouraged. And if it's the case that you're struggling tonight, this lesson certainly is for you. The author of Hebrews said in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 36, for you have need of endurance so that you, after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. When we grow weary, when it just seems like we can't keep on keeping on, there still needs to be endurance. And you need to know why that's necessary. And that's what this book is about. I mentioned to those of you who were here Sunday morning that it is my conviction that the book of Hebrews was probably first a sermon. And some sermons, in my judgment, are so good they have to be written down. It seems to me that this sermon was delivered to individuals who were struggling and the one who presented this material wanted them to know this is why you don't quit. You don't quit because Jesus is supreme. He is better. He's better because he is the one who has all authority. God is no longer speaking to the fathers through the prophets. He's speaking to us through his son. He's better because he has all power. He is the one through whom the worlds were made. He is the one who is at work upholding all things by the word of that power. And he is better because he by himself purged our sins when he went to the cross. You don't give up because Jesus is supreme. Jesus is better. But it's not just that Jesus is better. It's that his law is better. Those individuals were being pulled back into Judaism to go back to the traditions and the rituals that are found in the law of Moses. And the author of Hebrews wanted them to know that's not the direction that you need to go. Give the more earnest heed to the things which you've heard lest you drift away. That old law proves steadfast, but the law of Christ even more so. You don't turn back because we have a better covenant. And you don't come turn back because we have a better sacrifice. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. But it is absolutely possible that the blood of Jesus Christ, which was offered one time for all times, can and does do so. And so we rely upon the Savior, and we don't give up. Now, at that point in the book of Hebrews, everything changes. Because the author has told them what they need to know to remain faithful, but it remains for them to be encouraged, to be exhorted. You might find it interesting, but way on back in the history of the restoration movement in this country, when we had meetings like this, there was always someone who would come along and preach the gospel meeting, but there was also someone who would come up after him and who would exhort the people to obedience. Now, Tony, I'm not suggesting that you get up and exhort tonight when I'm done. Our folks may want to go home at some point. 
But I've often thought that that's not necessarily a bad idea. It's not bad for individuals to understand, yes, what you've heard matters, and here's why it matters, and here's what you do about it. Your life needs to be different because of this. We're not just involved in an intellectual exercise tonight. This is not just about learning more about Hebrews so that we can pass some sort of test. It's about asking ourselves, is my life different because of this? Am I not just reading what this says, even for the sake of understanding it? But am I willing to change my actions because of Jesus? Am I willing to do differently as a result of these facts? We started on Sunday and we talked about the difference that Jesus makes in our lives. We no longer have to be outsiders. He brings us into the holiest by his own blood. You don't have to live in fear. You don't have to live in doubt. You can live with courage and you can live with confidence because he is the high priest over the house of God. And consequently, you are to draw near to God and you are to hold fast the confession you've made without wavering and you are to show consideration for your brethren. That's how we enact this. I make sure that I'm obedient to God's plan. I make sure that I am steadfast in the confession that I have made without wavering because when you say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that is a pledge of allegiance that you are stating before all others. It's not merely a formula to be said before one is baptized, but it is your life, a promise. I'm on the Lord's side, no turning back. Will you be faithful to that? Those folks needed to be asked that question. And will you be an encourager to those who are around you? We spent time looking at the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, which is a description of faith's hall of fame. But within the context of the book, we talked about the puzzle pieces. And what we realize is that that section is there to remind us that there have been others who have gone before us who were faithful who responded to the word of God. God spoke and they heard and they obeyed just like we're supposed to do. And if it's possible for individuals in days gone by to respond favorably to the commands of God, then surely we have the ability to do the same. And God requires that of us. He demands such. We're going to continue tonight by looking at just a few verses at the very beginning of Hebrews, the 12th chapter. I'd like you to open your Bibles there. Hebrews chapter 12. And I want you to notice the help that is provided to us as we seek to get through the difficulties of life. Watch what the author says beginning in verse 1. Therefore, we also... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. We could spend all of our time on that verse tonight. We're not going to do that. But when you look at that verse You see at least three things that are of significance towards your fight against sin, towards your quest to be faithful. He tells us first and foremost, you look at the examples of those who have come before you. When he says we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, he's talking about the individuals who are mentioned by name all the way through Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his household. By faith, Abraham was willing to offer Isaac, his son, as a sacrifice. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down when they were encompassed. How did all those things happen? Because Noah did what God said. Because Abraham did what God said. Because Joshua and the Israelites did what God said. And so he's saying to those who were struggling, take a look around. There are individuals who have been faithful in days gone by, and if they could do it, so can you. If they could be faithful to the Lord in times of trial, in times of persecution, in times of difficulty, you have the ability to do the same. So he tells us, number one, look at the examples who've come before you. 
But then he also says something else. He says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. There are certain things that hinder us in our quest to be faithful to God. Things that stand in the way of faithfulness. It may be our own fleshly desires. It may be our desire for popularity. It could be our desire for a promotion. It could be the greed that gets in our way so often in this world. It simply could be your ambition or your devotion to something other than the cause of Christ. But there are roadblocks to faithfulness that impact our lives. And it is significant that in this passage, he does not list one particular sin that we all struggle with, but instead he says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Do you know why he doesn't mention one specific sin? Because James tells us that each one is tempted and drawn away by his own desires and enticed. There are struggles that you have in your own personal life that those sitting next to you may not have. But whatever those struggles are, we must lay them aside. There are certain things that are more important. And so you look at the examples of those who have gone before you, this verse tells us, and you make sure that you remove certain hindrances from your life to seek to live in a faithful way, and then you run with endurance the race that is set before us. Those struggling Christians needed to be told that you're not at the end of the line yet. Don't give up. Don't quit. Later in the same chapter, it's going to tell us to consider our Savior. Jesus didn't quit, nor should we. So you look at the examples of those who've come before you, and you remove the hindrances to faithfulness that happen to be in your life, and you run with endurance Toward what? Toward our Savior. If you don't remember anything else that I say, remember this. If you want to overcome the struggles in life, if you want to remain faithful, you focus on Jesus. You focus on Jesus. And verse 2, which is where we're going to spend the remainder of our time, helps us to note what we are to focus upon. Look at what he says. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. When we focus our attention on Jesus, what do we see? Number one, we see that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. That language is interesting to me. To describe Jesus as the author of our faith is to describe him as the source of our faith. That is a lesson that we need to be reminded of. We do not have the ability to write our own directions. We do not have the liberty to decide for ourselves what it is that we want to do or to do those things that make us feel in a certain way to do the things that we find that make us happy, but instead we allow Jesus to be the one who dictates to us exactly what we must do. We look unto Jesus who is the author of our faith. What does that mean? It means that when we speak, we speak what Jesus spoke. We teach what Jesus taught. That is the very great commission, isn't it? When he spoke to the disciples in Matthew, the 28th chapter, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What were the apostles supposed to teach? They were supposed to teach what Jesus taught. 
That was their task. Now, the Holy Spirit was going to bring those things to their, to their memory, John tells us. But it was their responsibility not to teach of their own authority, but to teach what Jesus taught. If Jesus is indeed the author of our faith, then he is the one who is the source of it. And so we teach what he taught and we do what he did. That's why Paul told the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. It is fair for us to look at our own lives and to ask, am I teaching what Jesus taught? Am I doing what Jesus did? Do my actions reflect what my Lord would have me to do? Am I seeking to live in a selfless, in a sacrificial manner? Or am I being selfish, focused only on what I get out of this? Jesus is the author of our faith. He's the source of it. But the text also calls him the finisher. What does that mean? Well, the idea of being the finisher is the idea of being the one who perfects. Jesus did not just dictate to us what we should do. He lived it. It's why we seek to follow in his steps. It's why we seek to do what he did. It's why he could say when he hung upon the cross, thus it is written and thus it was necessary, or why Luke could say uh, as Jesus' words, thus it is written and thus it was necessary for Christ to suffer and rise from the dead the third day. It's why Jesus could, while he was hanging upon the cross, say, it is finished. I've done the work which you have given me to do in his prayer. And of course, he did exactly that when he died upon the cross. He is the author of our faith, the source of it. He's the finisher of our faith, the perfecter. He went to the cross to do what we could not do for ourselves, to shed his blood so that we might have hope, so that we, through his blood, could be forgiven. And it's why in the Revelation that he is described as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. That's simply another way of saying the author of our faith and the finisher of our faith. Our faith comes from Jesus and our faith goes through Jesus. And so if you are struggling, you focus on Jesus who is the author and the finisher of our faith. But Hebrews chapter 12 doesn't just tell us to focus on Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith. It also tells us to focus on Jesus as our redeemer. Notice what he goes on to say in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. That phrase, for the joy that was set before him, almost seems quite difficult to us. How is it possible that Jesus, knowing the physical suffering that he was going to endure, could, as the text said, for the joy that was set before him, endure the cross. You look at his life and it becomes clear that he did not look forward to the suffering that he was going to have to face. There are several passages that show us that. In John the 12th chapter, for example, he was thinking about his impending death and he said, now my soul is troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. He understood why he came to this earth, yet that did not alleviate the fact that he was going to suffer, and it certainly did not remove the fact that he was human. He was God in the flesh. It's why in the Garden of Gethsemane that he prayed, Oh, my Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Your will be done. And sometimes in this life, we pray fervently, just like Jesus did when he prayed in the garden, and we wonder, God, why aren't you hearing me? 
Why aren't you answering me? And the book of Hebrews actually gives us some really insightful information regarding that. If you go back to Hebrews, the fifth chapter and the seventh verse, you're going to find something that's striking with regard to the prayer of Jesus. It says about him who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. Now stop there for just a moment. When did Jesus offer up that kind of prayer? The kind of prayer that was designed to save him from death, the kind of prayer that was offered with cries and with tears, surely the Garden of Gethsemane prayers in view here. Jesus understood suffering. He knew what he was going to have to face. He praised that prayer, and yet, the text goes on to say, he was heard because of his godly fear. Did God hear the prayer of Jesus? He did, didn't he? But the very next verse goes on to say, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. I do not know what you're going through. I don't know what burden you're bearing. I don't know what struggle you have tonight, but I do know this. Do not give up on God because he does not answer the prayer the way that you want it answered. The difference between the prayer of Jesus and our prayer is that Jesus, though he asked God for deliverance, was resigned to say, your will be done. Your will be done. Even though he was a son, and God heard that prayer, it was necessary for him, even for the joy that was set before him, which I think looks beyond the cross, by the way, that he endures the cross. He understood very clearly that it was only through his death that mankind might have redemption, and as a result of that, he was willing to endure the cross, despising the shame. We do not realize today, because we have the cross very prevalent in our culture, that it was indeed an instrument of cruelty designed and reserved for the vilest of sinners. It was a means of death whereby others would be taught a lesson. Bodies were hung upon the Roman crosses and they stayed there for weeks so that individuals who walked that path into the city would see this is what happens to the one who defies the Roman Empire. Jesus endured that cross, despising the shame. The shame which was always associated with the cross. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13 talks about that when it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. It was not viewed by individuals in the first century as a glorious death. It was viewed by individuals in the first century as a shameful death. But Jesus, who is the King of Kings, who had done no wrong, was willing to go to the cross for us. When Paul described that in Philippians, the second chapter, he said in verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. It's as if Paul is saying, not only did he die, but let me tell you what he was willing to do. He was willing to die on a cross. Of all the ways that one could die for the sake of humanity, Jesus died on the cross. That's what was reserved for sinners, criminals, individuals who deserve to be taught a lesson. Not someone who was led like a lamb to the slaughter and who as a sheep before his shears was silent, so he opened not his mouth. But to God be the glory, it's through that death that we have hope. Aren't you thankful for that tonight? 
Because in him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. If you're struggling, you focus your attention on Jesus. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He has the right to dictate the terms to us because he lived it. And it's our obligation to be obedient to him. He is our Redeemer who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. And he is thirdly from this section of Scripture, our Lord and our King. Notice the way verse 2 ends. It goes on to say, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I don't know if you have a favorite verse in Scripture. I've often kind of wondered whether we ought to. You know, every verse is inspired of God, and God gave us everything that we absolutely need. And so I almost hesitate to tell you, but I do have a favorite verse in Scripture. I love what is stated in in Luke chapter 24, verses 5 and 6 by the angels who happened to be at the tomb of Christ. You remember the women went to the tomb very early that Sunday morning. They were going to anoint the body with oil, give it a proper burial. They evidently did not think that the men who had done that had done what they could. They thought they could do it just a little bit better. And when they got to the tomb, they found the stone rolled away. And the angel said this, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here but is risen. There's not a more powerful statement in all of Scripture. We're here tonight because that tomb was found empty. Do you realize that? Everything about Christianity matters if Jesus defeated death. And if he did not defeat death, none of this matters. Our hope is rooted in the fact that Jesus broke forth from the tomb very early on that Sunday morning and that those angels actually said to those women, why are you looking for someone who's living here in the graveyard? He is not here. He defeated death. And when I'm struggling with difficulties in my life and I'm like these individuals to whom the book of Hebrews was written and I'm being pulled in one direction by tradition and my past and I'm being pulled in another direction by the desires of the flesh and a godless culture in which I find myself, I have to remind myself that none of those things matters. What matters is that Jesus broke forth from the tomb, that he defeated death, and because he defeated death, this world is not my home. There is so much better that I have the opportunity to look forward to, that you have the opportunity to look forward to. Death could not contain him. And so it says he is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That's a position of prominence. And we're reminded of that in so many other passages. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And he, talking about the Father, put all things under his, that is Christ's feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Jesus has all authority. And that's why every knee will eventually bow in his presence. Philippians 2, verses 9 and 10. Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That in the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And consequently, the one who is the author and finisher of our faith, the one who is our redeemer and the one who is our Lord and King. Not just any king, by the way, but the king of kings. Not just any impressive individual who's in a position of authority, but the Lord of lords. He has the right to direct our steps. And so we serve him. We yield our will to his. We obey him. These individuals to whom the book of Hebrews was written were a lot like us. They had difficulties that they were having a hard time resolving in their minds. Is it really worth it to face the persecution that I'm having to face? 
Should I really keep on keeping on? Can I find the strength? Do I have the energy to stop giving up and to simply give myself over to the Lord? How do we do it? The book of Hebrews tells us you focus on Jesus. He is supreme. His law is supreme. His sacrifice is supreme. What he has done for you, you could not do for yourself. You draw near to him, you hold fast your confession to him, and you encourage others. You look at the examples of those who've gone before you, realizing that it can be done, but most especially, you focus on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, our Redeemer, our Lord and our King. All of that requires our willingness to obey God's plan for our salvation. And it could be tonight that you know you need to do that. That you realize that you have not yielded your will in complete and full submission to the plan of God. And that tonight is the night to make the angels in heaven rejoice. We respond in faith. That faith is our willingness to hear what God says and do it to repent of our sins, to confess before others that we do believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, so that we can be held accountable for that, to be baptized, to have our sins washed away. If you haven't done that, you have the opportunity. And if you're here tonight and you have obeyed the gospel, but you haven't lived like you should, you can make your life right anew. If you need to respond, don't delay. Come right now as together we stand and sing. thankful that you have been with us this evening. Brother Chad has done another wonderful job of preaching God's Word to us. Uh, I thought as I listened to his lesson and tried to make several notes on it, <coughs> that there's so much there for those who maybe are young in the faith, so much to learn for those of us who've been Christians for many years, 
There's still so much of the wonderful power of God's Word and the wonderful way it was presented to us tonight. And I want to encourage you to be back with us again tomorrow night as we continue our study together from the book of Hebrews. And as he mentioned, we do have a number of preachers in our audience, and we're thankful you're here. We also have a lot of elders in the audience with us from several congregations. As I mentioned, Brother Jeff led us in our opening prayer this morning or this evening. And tonight at the end of our service, Brother Ronnie Hall, who serves as one of the elders of the only congregation, will be leading us in our dismissal prayer. We ought to be thankful for the elders of the Lord's Church and every congregation. They're the shepherds who are leading our souls to heaven, and we're thankful for them and appreciate them for being here. After we sing this final song, then Brother Ronnie will lead us in our dismissal prayer. Jesus, all bow. Our God, our most wonderful Father in heaven, we're indeed grateful for the opportunity we've had tonight to come together and hear another lesson from thy divine will. We're thankful for the ability this young man has as stood before us tonight to encourage us, help us as we walk from day to day to be an example of Christ in our lives as he has encouraged us to do. Be with us all tonight as we travel back to our homes. Keep us safe and bring us back if you be, have an opportunity to do so. In Christ's name do we humbly pray. Amen. Amen.